today I thought that in honor of the end of Feb Regency, I would make a video talking about Lord Byron and the Byronic hero. To be honest, I wanted to make this video during Feb Regency, but all of a sudden it's not February anymore, so we can just change the intent to this video is to commemorate Feb Regency instead. <laughs> So, um, I guess this video is going to be in like three parts. So I wanted to first talk about the qualities of a Byronic hero. And then I wanted to talk about if I think Lord Byron is actually a Byronic hero, because that's claimed a lot. And then I was going at the end to talk about other examples of Byronic heroes that I have read in other literature. So in terms of defining what a Byronic hero is, I really wanted to just look at Lord Byron's characters that are considered Byronic and look at what are qualities that they all have in common and use that to give my definitions of what qualities a Byronic hero has. So the three works by him that I looked at are Child Harold's Pilgrimage, specifically of course Child Harold in that poem, and then Manfred in his play Manfred, and then Cain in his play Cain. And I came up with my list of the qualities that they all have in common that make them what we consider Byronic. So the first one is they're all a recluse. Uh, Child Harold basically exiles himself from England and he goes wandering around England alone. And then Manfred is very alone in his play. He talks about how he's always preferred to be alone and he uh, has a difficult time being with other people and he prefers to be alone. And then Cain is also uh, kind of very mentally outcasted. He doesn't understand why Adam and Eve and Abel do what they do. And then of course, at the end of the play, we see him being forced to be exiled. The next one is a mysterious past. In the beginning of the play, Manfred, he asks a bunch of spirits, which it's one of my favorite parts of the play, by the way, is the descriptions of the spirits that he calls upon, because I just think, I just love it. I love it. He calls upon the spirits and he asks them to give him forgetfulness. And when they're asking him, well, what do you want to forget? He doesn't want to tell them. And then um, Child Harold in Child Harold Pilgrimage is also mentioned at times that he has a past we don't know about. He doesn't want to tell people. It brings him no, um, it says like it brings him uh, nothing to tell others about it. And he doesn't want to speak about what's happened in the past. So Byronic heroes tend to have a mysterious dark past that they don't want to tell anyone about. <laughs> the next one is that they're very passionate. Um, but I think it's more so they're, they're very, they, they have a lot of emotions, but they don't show it to other people. So I don't, what would I term that instead of passionate? Um, secretly passionate? I don't know. <laughs> like they, they do experience a, a lot of feeling, but you wouldn't know that if you just met them because they're very secretive about it and they don't really open up to people. Um, if you look at Kane, he is very angry. He's very pissed off all the time. He's pissed off at Adam. He's pissed off at Eve. He's pissed off at Abel. He's pissed off at God. Like He's so mad. <laughs> the whole poem, <laughs> or sorry, it's not a poem. It's a play. The whole play is just pissed off. Manfred as well. Manfred is angry the whole entire time in his, in his play. So I think um, being very passionate let's say slash angry passionate slash angry because uh, byronic heroes are i think angry a lot and i think that that fits with one of their qualities so the next one is defiant towards authority um i actually one of my one thing i really like about manfred is his defiance towards authority because i found it really hilarious in the play because he will summon these really powerful spirits and then you know, ask them for help, but when they don't give him what he wants, he just, 
he's just like, screw you. And he's so mean. And I just, I really love the way that he's defiant towards authority. I thought it was hilarious. Kane's also defiant, obviously. He's defiant towards his parents. And most importantly, he's defiant towards God. So they're definitely defiant towards authority. And I kind of tend to like it a little bit. I think it's funny. Another important thing about Byronic Heroes is that they have a redeeming quality. They're not a hundred percent horrible. They usually have something that even though they seem to be very mean, very pessimistic individuals, there's something about them that causes readers to feel sympathy for them. I guess I could also say viewers because I know that, you know, with movies and TV shows, you can find a lot of Byronic heroes there, but we're talking about literature here, okay? Reading, <laughs> sympathy that you can feel when reading them. One thing that I found common um, with the characters that I was looking at for this video is that they seem to dislike everyone, but they have love for one person. And I think that that tends to be their redeeming quality is that they still are capable of love and they very passionately love this one person. Now, can that, you know, very passionate love become toxic? Yeah, but I mean, Pyronic heroes are just toxic in general, so can they do anything that's not toxic? I don't know. We look at Manfred. Uh, he had this, is this a spoiler? You know what? I'm just gonna say <laughs> Manfred fits this. I don't know if it's a spoiler. Um, maybe. Is this whole video spo spoilers for characters? I don't know. Um, let's just say Man, I'll just tell you that Manfred fits this seems to dislike everyone but there's one person that he doesn't manfred fits it no child harold fits this he's described at one point as, as a sister whom he loved and um at one point it's mentioned that um in the past he loved someone that he couldn't have so child harold fits that as well the two last ones i have i'm just just putting up there because i i think that you can kind of see it throughout all these other examples so i don't really think there's any point going you know more into them um but the, the last two qualities i have are intelligent and brooding so those are my list of qualities um that i think from all of these characters you can find what makes a byronic hero all right so now i'm going to talk about <laughs> do i think that lord byron is the real life embodiment of a Byronic hero. Okay, I've always liked Lord Byron, and when I heard people say that he was like a Byronic hero originally, I was like, how dare you say that? That's not true. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, it is true. I can't deny it, it is true. So obviously Child Herald of Child Herald's Pilgrimage is kind of where a lot of people point to when they're talking about the Byronic hero as Lord Byron's initial conception of the Byronic hero um, is credited to Child Harold. A lot of people, when Child Harold's Pilgrimage came out, Cantos 1 and 2 came out in 1812, and then Cantos 3 and 4 came out later, I think in 1816, I think. Um, but when he released Cantos 1 and 2, a lot of people in the public were claiming that Child Harold is just Lord Byron, and Lord Byron was very adamant that this is not the case. Um, that, that Child Harold is just an imaginary person, that it is not him. And I, you know, I, because part of me was, was troubled. Well, why does he so adamantly say that Child Harold is not <laughs> him? And I think it's because, okay, I don't think that when, because he started writing Cantos 1 and 2 in 1809, because 1809 is when Lord Byron went on his grand tour of Europe, which is, uh, what the Child Herald's pilgrimage is kind of based off of. And I don't think that when he wrote that, that he was like a Byronic hero at the time. I think what's eerie about it is that I think by the time that he releases Cantos 3 and 4 in 1816, I think at that point he had become a Byronic hero. Which I think is just, like I said, really interesting because when he, I think when he created Child Harold, this character with a dark past, um, a love he cannot have, uh, very brooding, um, in exile from England, like a self-imposed exile from England, all of this, 
uh, Lord Byron was nothing like that when he created it, but as he continues to live, and then by the time he finishes the poem, he kind of has become the character that he's created. I mean, in 1816, he leaves England after his failed marriage with Anne Isabella, and he never returns. And it's kind of a self-imposed exile from England, just like Child Harold. And then Child Harold has this dark past that we don't get to learn about. And by the time Lord Byron leaves in 1816, he's leaving a, um, a past full of all of these rumors of, you know, his incestuous relationship with Augusta and all of these things that people are saying he's done and he's kind of leaving a, like a dark past. And I think that it's just, I, I don't think that when he created Child Harold originally, he was like Child Harold, like a Byronic hero. But I do think that as he continued to grow, um, he did become a Byronic hero. <laughs> and I do think that, yeah, he, he does fit a, a living embodiment of a Byronic hero. And I do understand why people say that. I guess things that go against him being a Byronic hero is he was extremely sociable. Lord Byron was never alone. When he went on his grand tour, he was not alone. He had tons of people with him at certain points. Um, I know that there was a friend of his that went with him the whole time. And then at certain points of the grand tour, they had, like, they were with a lot of people. And Lord Byron was just extremely sociable person um he was not <laughs> someone that was alone and a recluse like the byronic heroes typically are but so do i think lord byron is a byronic hero yeah okay i guess so <laughs> i guess he kind of is yeah so now talking about uh, other examples that i've read in literature who are considered byronic heroes so um when i was thinking about <laughs> this video i was like man byronic heroes suck like i don't like them because <laughs> typically um two characters that i've read that are really commonly associated with byronic heroes are heathcliff from mothering heights and captain ahab from moby dick and i was like man i don't like byronic heroes but i was thinking about okay well what are other examples of byronic heroes that I've read. And when I was doing that, I realized, okay, maybe maybe I don't hate all Byronic heroes. Maybe I don't hate all Byronic heroes, okay? Because I have some examples of other characters that I've read that I think are Byronic, okay? The first one is A Winter's Promise. There's a character in this called Thorn. Now, I think that he definitely fits the descriptions of a literary character that is a Byronic hero. So I, okay, the fourth book, uh, which I pretend doesn't exist, <laughs> but which, whatever. If you look at the fourth book, I don't have it because I got rid of it because like I said, I pretend it doesn't exist because I hate it. <laughs> but um, if there's a blurb on the cover that says, this is a mixture of Pride and Prejudice and something else. I don't remember what the other one was. But I remember when I when I first got that book, I saw that and I was like, what are they talking about? And the whole time I was reading the book, I was just hating on the blurb on the cover because I was like, who wrote this blurb? Like, what do you mean that this is like Pride and Prejudice? And I could never understand why anyone would claim that this series is similar to Pride and Prejudice. It's just like, what in the world is this? And it dawned on me when I was thinking about Thorn in the, in these books. Now he's Byronic. Um, it dawned on me that I think that maybe the reason why that whoever wrote that blurb <laughs> references Pride and Prejudice is because he's kind of like Darcy in a way. Um, and so that's I guess that's why they bring up Pride and Prejudice, but I just had a light bulb moment of like, oh my gosh, I think that's why that blur that I've been hating on for like a year <laughs> said Pride and Prejudice because Thorn is kind of like Darcy and Darcy is, I mean, a typical Byronic hero. So I think that that's why they say that. Um, Thorn in this book 
he is very closed off, very brooding. I mean, just Byronic, so Byronic, just completely a Byronic hero. Um, and so I definitely think that he fits the characteristics of a Byronic hero. Um, I also wanted to, I was trying to find a female uh, version of a Byronic hero. And I thought of Dreamer's Pool by Juliette Marillier. This is the second book. I don't own the first book anymore. Um, it is actually not my favorite Juliette Marillier uh, trilogy series. Is this a trilogy? I don't know. Uh, I didn't finish it because <laughs> it's not my favorite. Um, I, I met, this was actually in my pile of books to get rid of. But luckily, I hadn't got rid of it yet. So I can at least show you this. But this is the second book. In the first book... Well, she's in the second book too, but whatever. I'm going to reference the first book because I didn't end up reading this because I didn't enjoy the first book that much. Um, but I love Julia Murley's other stuff. Don't think that means I don't like Julia Murley. That's not what I'm saying. I just, it's not my favorite. But in the first book, you have one of the main characters is called Blackthorn and she is a healer. She is very brooding. She hates everyone. She does not want to be around anyone. She just wants to be alone. She's very self-destructive both in action and in thought. She also has a dark past in um, the first book. Like she has a bunch of horrible stuff happen to her before the book starts. And these are what's caused her to be so negative and destructive. And uh, part of me was like, well, can I consider her a Byronic hero? Because she does spend the first book helping other people, but it's not by choice. She basically, um, she was in prison, and that's not a spoiler, okay, she's in prison when the book starts, and in order to get out of prison, she makes a deal that her quest for revenge has to be put on hold for seven years, and they'll get her out of prison. She, she just, she wants revenge, she's very narrow-minded on getting revenge, but she's forced to put her revenge aside for seven years, and it's very, very difficult for her because basically her desire for revenge is the only thing that keeps her going which is really similar obviously to captain ahab in moby dick i mean captain ahab's desire for revenge is really the only thing that's keeping him going um it's all he cares about is dang moby dick <laughs> i mean he's just so narrow-minded on it and i think that's similar to blackthorn is that's all she's thinking about that's all she cares about um and i really i really liked blackthorn even though uh, a Dreamer's Pool did not end up being, you know, a favorite Juliet Murley book of mine. I still really loved Blackthorn. I I just love it. I don't know. It was refreshing to me to, to read a character like her, and I did really enjoy her. Now, the last example that I have, Cal from East of Eden. And I think Cal really fits with a Byronic hero, but I think that what's interesting about Cal in this book is that I think he sh kind of is showing the the process through which someone could become a Byronic hero. Uh, you see in this book, Cal is very brooding. He is very negative. He's very self-destructive. Uh, and it breaks my heart. I love Cal. My favorite characters in this book are Charles, Tom, and Cal in that order. And Cal, I just... I loved him so, so much, so clearly I can love a Byronic hero because I absolutely love Cal in this book, and I think that kind of, is he gonna go full-fledged Byronic or not, is like what really tugged at my heartstrings when reading this. And there's actually a scene in this book, um, cause you know, you have Cal and his brother Aaron, and they're kind of in place for Cain and Abel. Just how like, Cain, obviously the biblical story, but also in Lord Byron's play Cain. Cain and Abel both offer a sacrifice to God and one thing that you know you see starts to make Cain uh, very upset is that God favors Abel's sacrifice over his. And there's actually a scene in this book where a uh, Cal gives his father Adam a gift and his father isn't very happy with it and in fact he's basically telling him to return it. And when he's doing that, he even says a comment of, I would have liked it better if you had just given me something like your brother has. And you see Cal very, very upset over this and just feeling like such an outcast, such a recluse, like nobody understands him. He doesn't understand any of them. He feels unloved. He feels like there's just this 
innate wrongness in him, this innate evil inside of him. And you really see him struggling with this. And I really think that Cal could fit with the Byronic hero. He's reclusive. He feels like an outcast. He is very brooding. He's very gloomy. He doesn't have a dark past, but that's fine. <laughs> they don't have to have everything, right? What's his redeeming quality? I think his redeeming quality you can see numerous times throughout his story. Uh, and that's just not a bias, okay? Because I love him so much. No, I mean, you see multiple times where he wants to do the right thing. He, you know, like when he gives his, when, oh my heart, when he was giving his father his gift and his father did not like it. I mean, I was like screaming when I was in because I feel so horrible for him because he was like so happy about it and he worked so hard to get the gift and like you just feel so bad for him um and I think that's the thing with Byronic heroes is you feel bad for them well you're supposed to most Byronic heroes I don't feel bad for them but if I'm saying that Cal is a Byronic hero he is a Byronic hero that made me feel very very sympathetic for him but like I said I think the difference of Cal and every single other character that I've mentioned in Lord Byron and the other examples I gave, I think the difference is that I don't think that Cal is really a full-fledged Byronic hero in this book. I think what makes him really interesting when talking about a Byronic hero is I feel like he is showing how someone could become a Byronic hero and he's in that stage Oh my gosh, I'm sorry if you can hear that. <laughs> it's my fridge. Ignore it. He shows that stage of battling with, do I become Byronic or not? I just, I think, I think Cal and his story is really interesting in terms of a Byronic hero. And I just love him. I love Cal. I mean, I love this whole book. I really love East of Eden by John Steinbeck, but... That is it for, for um, I know I, I didn't really go into much detail about A Winter's Tale, I'm realizing. Um, I don't know, there's not much to say. Thorn is, I think he's Byronic. <laughs> um, there's not much to say about it. I absolutely love this series though. Minus the fourth book. <laughs> we pretend that one doesn't exist. I have some theories as to why the fourth book is so bad. One of them's a conspiracy theory. Okay. And then one of them's probably more, you know, more likely what happened but whatever but i absolutely love these books thorns byronic okay i don't know what else <laughs> much to say about it he fits the description so that's it for this video uh talking about lord byron and byronic heroes and i hope that you enjoyed it and goodbye <laughs>